and we are live. Good evening, my whiskey brothers and sisters, and welcome to the fifth episode of the Alberta Scotch Society and Friends Whiskey Book Club. As always, we are honored to have you, the viewer, our panel, and Davin de Caljamou, the author of Canadian Whiskey, the New Portable Expert. Let's get that book up there. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> This is, as it was last week and all the weeks previous, actually, uh, quite exciting for me. I get to spend it with you most excellent people, and we get to talk a little bit about Canadian history. Tonight, we're dealing with the second part of Section 4, entitled The Concise History of Canadian Whiskey, chapters 14, 15, 16, to be exact. Uh, without further ado, let's do roundtable introductions with your name, other platform handles, and tell us what's in your glass tonight. And we're going to start with you, Davin. Hi, I'm Davin de Kergamo. I wrote that book uh, at Davin, D-E-K, D-A-V-I-N-D-E-K on social media. And I'm drinking Two Brewers Classic. Oh, nice. What number? I, I think it's 22. It can't be 22. It's not on yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, an old one. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You heard about it? Number 10. Oh. All righty. Hi, With your mouth I Sorry, also buddy. do my whiskey ass, and I'm doing the Canadian Club 20-year-old. Excellent. Oh, hi. It's uh, Yukon Dave here in my basement, and today I'm saying thanks to Dr. Don, and I got a wiser 15. 15. Can't nice. tell my <laughs> In my glass also. Hi, I'm Don. Um, you can find me at the Whiskey Dive on Instagram, Twitter, and whiskeydive.com. And I am drinking Canadian Club Classic 12. Nice. And me, my friends, we are with this one, Seagram's VO. So I'm Dolph Shaw. I'm the president of the Alberta Scotch Society, heading up this ragtag group of fellas tonight. And we're going to have a fun time. We're looking forward to it. And tonight, we are talking about, specifically, uh, we're focusing on the Seagrams, the Brothmans, Harry Hatch, the Walkers, and the Weisers. All important families in relation to whiskey, for sure, but also in other venues. And we're talking about this a little bit, well, two minutes ago, actually. But I wanted to know, and I'm asking the whole panel, not just Davin, but I'm sure we'll want Davin at the end. Are their initial businesses as important as the whiskey for these gentlemen? So the mills, the cattle, the grocery store is one more important than the other, or do they work perfectly in tandem? So let's go to everybody. So it's not just me on the screen. Here we go. Well, I, I believe it started off. They didn't start off thinking they're going to be a big distillery. It just ended up being that way. Most of those guys seem to be in the grain business or something else. And distilling was kind of just added in there. So. Yeah, I mean, you, as you read it, you kind of see like their their entrepreneurship and their initial <laughs> enterprise, if you would, is kind of what built their foundations. That's so, a kind way of saying they were very much cutthroats. I, <laughs> well, I'm an American, so <laughs> well, uh, not, not all of them, right? <laughs> fancy words, right? <laughs> but uh, but no, it, it's it, it's kind of you know helped build them be who they were so so yeah I, I think it was just as important as their their whiskey ventures oh yeah i found very much around that uh one supported the other one and it very much was a married between all the different industries that related to each other between the weight the wheat and the grain and like davin was saying you know a wane uh, just a uh, disposal you know you end up getting to hogs and cattle and whatever just for feed and then what do you do with all the rest of it? You make whiskey. <laughs> well, I always wanted to think that whiskey was the most important, but I'm, I'm going to throw it to you, Devin. Monetarily, well, was you know more important than the others for these gentlemen? They started out as flour mills. They made, they distilled the waste, the leftover grain, uh, primarily to make cattle feed because they all had feed lots. And then the, the, the alcohol was the third product. It was really a, a waste. And, you know, you see some distilleries, uh, you know, just getting rid of the alcohol, you know, to what whoever would take it, whatever store would take it. 
Over time, in every case, whiskey became the biggest profit center. And one by one, they closed their mills. And one by one, they came to focus on making spirits. And that was, and that became their primary busy business. Yeah, it makes sense because you know, in the late 1800s, when you're making a million gallons of whiskey, how much, uh, how much milling are you doing <laughs> to compare to the, you know, a million gallon? Yeah. <laughs> Well, like we, ha we have decent distilleries out there now that are not even close to that in the Scotch world. You know, mm -hmm. they're putting 350,000 gallons and they're a primary distillery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a lot less competition in Canada. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Next question, gentlemen, it has to do with this bottle right here. So Davin tells us the meaning of the VO... The initials are lost in time forever. I want to know if there's anyone that's got a guess out there what VO is. Very outright voluptuous. I have no idea, but I'm wondering if anyone's got any idea what the VO. And that's why I picked up this bottle was because no one knew it. And it, just that little nit, little bit of history made me want to buy it. So any well, guess? I did a little reading ahead on on uh, Google, and they told me it meant uh, very own, and it was done for the son's wedding. But there okay. was another story there too, and that's the one I like the best. So that's usually the one I tell. Usually the one you go with. Yeah, I thought very old, maybe. Yeah, they, they debate very old or very own, but if somebody's saying that it was very own, they haven't done their research. I don't what? believe so because. You you can a lot of people do the research and they stop when they have an answer, but you have to dig deeper because there's no defin. I have not found any definitive answer to that question. I found I found both, but neither neither had real good uh, corroborating evidence. Well, yeah, there was there was no. This is this is the facts. It was this was the best the best guess at the time is that's what they thought it was for. Oh, so. who did that research? I just I just Googled it. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, you know, I guess Google is pretty good. You can use that to to um, uh, diagnose all your ailments as well. <laughs> it's always good. <laughs> you mean I <laughs> couldn't believe everything I read? <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Next question. Uh, are there any of these characters that you have a kinship with, a uh, kinship with, someone who you just like a whole bunch out of all these guys that you read about? I'll throw mine in, but I want to yeah. know. <laughs> I think right. Sam yeah. Hoffman would be my guy. Yeah. I just kind of liked him. I'd probably go with Wiser's. He's from where I'm from in New York. Well, not really where I'm from, but we're both from New York. So, wow. okay. mm. I kind of went uh, across all three of them because there's little bits of me in all of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, considering that, you know, I basically called them crooks earlier. <laughs> we talked about that last week with Prohibition, people having a little bit of sense of uh, of adventure. That's good. That's what we'll call it. Yeah. So for me, it was the same thing. Uh, Mr. Sam, Mr. Brown. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to read you a quote. And this is this is pretty well. Why? So it's on page 132. So he could be foul-mouthed, cruel, ruthless, yet he inspired loyalty, respect, and perhaps even love in those who knew him well. Despite many shortcomings, Samuel Bronfman was one of the most brilliant businessmen Canada has ever known and perhaps will ever know. So that was my favorite. And Davin, did you have someone that kind of stood out yeah. for you? Unquestionably, Sam Bronfman. Oh, he good. is probably one of the most brilliant whiskey producers ever in the history of the world. Okay. He had a wonderful palate. He essentially defined what we now call Canadian whiskey. Mm -hmm. Sam Bronfman really, he, he's the guy who, like he in, he invented the, the, the way that whiskey is blended. That was done at his request. He developed so many of the whiskey grains. He developed yeast strains. He really, and, and he, he really, Wow. More than anything, his interest was quality. He wanted quality above anything else. He wouldn't tolerate anything. He was brilliant. Like he's he's responsible for a number of the very 
famous scotches as well, like Chivas Regal. That's blended. That was he owned it and he told taught them how to blend it. You know, and and there are other they like the Glen Livet, you know, and rums and all kinds of things. He's the guy was just phenomenal. And I mean, and he, I mean, he he cr created at least six multi-billion-dollar dynasties with his children. You know, no one's made the kind of money he made. No one's even come close. And uh, above all, he didn't go broke like every one of the others did. <laughs> I think the problem is he didn't have a third generation for some reason that wanted to give it away. Because did we notice that it was the third generation yeah. that destroyed it for everybody? Yeah. yeah. Any yeah. thoughts on why it's the third generation? Anyone they want to reap all the benefits? They have no skin in it. Yeah. Come too easily. Yeah. By the time they, 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 they don't care. Yeah. Well, and it didn't sound like they wanted to really do any hard work. Like they weren't interested in spending long hours and doing stuff. It was easier to just sell it and take the cash and go. Yeah. Edgar wanted to hang around with movie stars. Yeah. 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 So like for you know half the whiskey in the, the mm -hmm. stores, it's like, yeah, good enough for me. That will give me a good life and I don't have to really work at anything. Already. This this one surprised me. No, uh, we were talking about this off air that there is a lot of information in this, a lot of tidbits that were surprised. And this one was the biggest surprise for me. Okay. Did anyone else know that we bottled in bond before the U.S.? No. no. 1883 we start, and they start in 1897. So I would have guessed the U.F. would have done before us. I would have further bet that it was the result of prohibition, and I would have lost money on both of them. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Teach you a lesson. Don't bet on things you don't know. Exactly. I had a childhood friend that would ask me to bet on a game. He said, pick anyone, I'll pick the other. And he won most of the time because I'd vote with my heart. And he <laughs> he didn't he knew that. He knew that. So that was, were we first in the world for bottled in bond? Yeah, let's explain bottle in the bond. Well we had bonded warehouses. I don't think we well, we did call it bottled in bond. Some called it bottled in bond. But what they did is they uh, they passed regulations. They passed rules saying that whiskey had to be aged for a minimum of two years. Now, uh, most of the big distillers were already aging their whiskey for, for longer than that. I think that uh, Hiram Walker, for example, was already selling Canadian Club as a seven-year-old whiskey before that uh, that happened you know he had ma warehouses and warehouses full of mature whiskey and imperial another uh, higher marker brand was uh, i think a four-year-old and he had um, uh, old magnolia these, these were all mature whiskeys but the problem back then is that a lot of people didn't pay their taxes the small producers didn't pay their taxes the government didn't give a hoot about the quality of the whiskey. And this is a mistake that a lot of people make. They assume the government was uh, put this legislation in place to improve the quality of whiskey, to make sure our whiskey tasted good. That was an unintended consequence, and it was great for us, but the, the only thing they wanted was to collect their taxes. They wanted to know if the whiskey's not got any color in it, the taxes haven't been paid. And uh, they very quickly put what they called nuisance distillers out of business because the, the, the little guys couldn't afford to hold on to whiskey for two years. And so they were gone and only the big guys, uh, you know, could do it. So it was, uh, it was uh, uh, a regulation intended to, to uh, generate revenue to make sure people paid their taxes. Now the, uh, sure the Americans followed us uh, later on for the same reason. And the Scottish fought, waited 25 years before they did it. And what's really cool is that I got to see the, the correspondence between their Ministry of Finance and our Ministry of Finance when the Scots were thinking of putting an aging regulation on Scotch whiskey. Yeah. It was so interesting because they never, ever, ever mentioned what it does to the whiskey. All they talked about was how it improved uh, revenues, how it made it much easier to collect taxes and to make sure that the tax had been paid. It's something like we have benefited so tremendously as a result of government action that was never intended to, to do that. In fact, it probably created the idiot. So However, 
I would have been wrong. I thought they would have done it first. And that was after uh, the War of Independence, not not Prohibition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, that, it was 18... Eight, yeah, it was not, no, it was, it was way before Prohibition. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, what we'll do now, gentlemen, is we'll, we'll do a roundhouse, see what's in our glasses, talk about it a little bit more. Davin, do you want to go first? You always have that option. Well, uh, I've got the this two brewers number ten classic. That's just an inventory number that's written on there. Those uh, number forty and uh, <laughs> it, it's it's a real classic uh, single malt whiskey, barley single malt whiskey, and I really quite enjoy it. It's got a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, uh, nuttiness and a little bit of fruitiness. It's it's got some something that's it's a kind of like like. Uh, pecans or something like that, or hazelnuts maybe, something like that, you know? And um, I find it's got just a little bit of a of a bite on the finish. I, I really quite enjoy it. It's, uh, it's really good from two brewers in the Yukon. Well, from two brewers to Yukon Dave from two brewers. Hi, guys. I've got my uh, Weiser's 15. The girlfriend really likes the bottle, so that bottle is going to be staying behind. Okay. Uh, Got a great nose. I get kind of a brown sugar. I keep thinking rum raisin, but I can't pick up the raisin, but I'd like it to taste, uh, smell like that. Uh, <laughs> very malty, very, very, uh, a little rich, uh, oily. I like it on a mouthfeel. And just a hint of, uh, hint of alcohol on the end. Kind of a medium finish, medium long, medium long finish on it. Yeah. Cool stuff. Thanks, Don. And oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, for the last couple of weeks, I have been uh, bolstering this bad boy. And as you can see by the level in it, it's going down quickly. You guys are turning yep. into an alcoholic on this. <laughs> I have to, I guess that goes back to Dr. Don. Um, mm -hmm. It is just such an easy whiskey to taste it it is so nice and light got a, a nice sweetness like a, almost a well burnt brown sugar kind of start to it. it gives you this tiny little tingle just on the tip of your tongue just wakes you up and go hmm i want more of that <laughs> all righty and down to done so again i have a canadian, canadian club classic 12 um i've Kind of be going at it while we were talking. Uh, burnt toffee, uh, definitely rye. Actually, the rye is fantastic in this. Uh, I, I think it's pretty well balanced. There's a little bit of a bite towards the end, which you know it's not bad. It's it's quite enjoyable. Um, I'm happy I picked it up. I've only ever had the oh whatever the eighteen dollar bottle of Canadian Club is, and I mean I never hated it, but I've always wanted to experience more. So. Uh, I'm really curious how your 21 year old or, or what is it? 20, uh, 20 year old. I'm really curious how that tastes. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool. I, I like the uh, kind of burnt coffee to it. All righty. Yeah. Good one. Thank you very much. And up to me. And again, I've got the Seagram's VO. So I got to say, I would have never bought this before. I've seen this uh, on the shelves probably from the past, well, my whole lifetime I've seen it and, and never had it before. Uh, introduced to it because of this book. And I'm glad I had it. It's, and I've learned that my palate for Canadian whiskeys has to be different from my palate for uh, other whiskeys, for, for, for scotches. I look for different things in scotches than I now look for in Canadian whiskeys mm -hmm. because I was really not introduced to blends previous to this. I'd, I'd have some blends and I'd enjoyed some of them, but it was really single malt scotch, single barrel if I could, SMWS, uh, up there with the Black Adder. Anyone that would produce something from a single cask was what I always wanted and what I always looked for. This is different from that. And when you're looking at the Canadian blends, even my 40-year-old and 41-year-old behind me, when I first had them, I didn't appreciate them as much as I am now. And so, Davin, cheers to you for that. Uh, it is. And the appreciation's there now. And it's taken a couple weeks because at first, 
I, I, I went to my standards. My, well, I went to my two brewers. I, I went to, uh, what is it? Oh, I'll look at it right now. Hammond <laughs> Graham and Warts, and uh, there it is. Uh, the Glen Breton. The ones that I tried that were single malt before because they have the, the, a taste that's similar to the single malts in Scotland. So that's kind of where I was and not really branching out as much. So now I'm branching out. Last week was the Gooderham Warts and the Four Grain. And I liked it a lot. And this week with this, and I've got another one for the After Dram later. But this last week's mouthfeel was fantastic this one doesn't have the same mouthfeel so this is a light mouthfeel it's 40 percent uh i get cloves i get ginger cinnamon and kind of dark fruits and and that's good i i've always liked that but there's something i can't tell uh, there's a wood flavor to it that's kind of eluding me so it's a bit peppery a little bit hotter and it's not an oak flavor it's it's a different wood to it so davin i don't know if you can like sandal this. wood maybe or no, I've bought in sandalwood before, and I think I can identify that with the Japanese whiskeys that I have, or maybe that's just a thought in my mind. But it, it's a different wood, and maybe I'll figure it out. If not, I'll bombard it with water and figure it out soon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a short finish, it ends, and it's not complex. It's one-dimensional, but I like it. So, And that happens a lot with young whiskeys that I try, if it's Scotland or wherever else. If it's a young whiskey, there's tons of flavor to it, but it ends quickly. And I do like that, and you have to appreciate it for what it is. It's a $30 bottle, and if you want something that you want to taste and enjoy, I won't – I don't mix my drinks. I don't make mixes really very often, but I will be giving this to the other people in the Alberta Scotch Society and the other people on here tonight just so you can taste this too. So I'll send some samples out there. So thank you very much. And are we ready? Back into the questions. Hey, I got. I got. Just want to make a comment here. Do it. Something that you said, Dolph, is I never had any Canadian whiskey on my thing, and I I ended up buying seven bottles last week, and <laughs> six of them were six I, I I like, and one is disappointing, and. I'm glad I would have never done this if it wasn't for the book club and uh, <laughs> and all the information I got from Davin and the rest of you guys. So, yeah, you've you educated an old dog. <laughs> well, you're not that old. I know we bugged you last week about it, but yeah. you're not. <laughs> Tell you what, Davin still ruined me on Canadian whiskey in his uh in his master class at Banff. I I want to bottle that Bush Pilot 13 bad. <laughs> 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 All right. is there a better story in this section than this one u.s distillers try to squeeze walker out of the market they petition the government they ask the government to ensure that he puts a label on his whiskey stating that it's canadian and it backfires canadian whiskey gets more popular and then because it's so popular, then the Americans start counterfeiting the same bottle, trying to make the, the label. They're trying to make the whiskey. And what he does is the, he calls them out by name, mm. and it gets even more popular. So I, that, that's one of my favorite stories. So I want to know if there's a kind of favorite story, something that kind of struck home for one of you gentlemen. Well, I think, you know, we should remember that that story about the Americans making and put Canadian on the bottle is not true. Okay, and, and I think I, 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 I hope, read it I, your book, buddy. I, I, yes, but you, and I think that maybe I could have made it a little more clear, saying that that the um, the uh, lore of Canadian of whiskey is often built on oral uh, legends, which yeah. don't necessarily bear out in truth yeah. or in reality. And what yeah. happened is that, and I, but I did say, give examples that he he was making other whiskeys at the same time that were better sellers that did not have the word Canadian on them, and they didn't make him put Canadian on that. Hmm. And there's been never been any, and no one has ever been able to find um, evidence that that petition actually ever really exists. And that includes um, a, uh, a law clerk who spent months trying to find that petition. So, uh, so uh, maybe, maybe I could have worded that a little more clearly. 
Because, it's a good story. <laughs> because that's a story that people tell to sell to sell a Canadian club, but it's not true. That I'd like it matter. <laughs> oh no, I have never been able I to find any like evidence that it's true. true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> any <laughs> other actual <laughs> stories that that are true that you like? The story of him putting big posters up with the pictures of people who were counterfeiting his whiskey. That is absolutely true. I think I think that should happen today. Like we should go after these kind these all these uh people taking advantage all the time. Like now the lawyers would get involved. I mean, gee whiz. Yeah, I think that was that was the best thing I read there that they actually called somebody on it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Take me to court if you want. And they left them alone. So one, I'm glad the story story was true. one of the stories I really enjoyed in the book, how they had a 65 room house that they donated as an orphanage. First yeah. off, who the heck owns 65 bedrooms in their house? Yeah. Well, they weren't all bedrooms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Only one, you know. I <laughs> just like, yeah, we don't need this 65 room house anymore. Let's just give it away. Well, no, no, uh, no, uh, he had died. Jo oh, Joseph, yeah. Joseph Seagram had died, and yeah. it was his grandkids who gave the house to the to the town as a uh, as an orphanage to use as an orphanage. So was was there, a tax, was there a tax deduction attached to that? <laughs> You know what? I, I really don't know. It wouldn't surprise me, but it wouldn't surprise me if there wasn't either. These were very community-minded people. They sure I mean, look at Hiram, look at Hiram Walker, who who bought, pay, built the town, paid the police out of his own pocket, paid the firemen out of his own pocket, paid for all the electricity for all the houses in the town, paid for the water. Built the hospital. You know, all these people were very community-minded, yeah. Was that Walkerville, too? Walkerville, yeah. yeah. Walkerville. Yeah, that was the one I was about to bring that one up. I, I really loved how he uh, started a distillery and then created a community. Yeah. yeah. Was it yeah. also Walker that gave out the cash bonuses to the staff? Because he, he said the liquid bonuses never made it home. Yeah. That was Wiser. Oh, Wiser did that. That was a good <laughs> one. I chuckled at that one. Good one. Yeah. yeah. So we have Nicole online, and she, she asks us this question. When brands use geographical points of origin to differentiate themselves and assert superiority, as customers, are we getting the best product or just the best marketing story? I guess it depends on the product, maybe. It's marketing. Give me a break. It's 100% <laughs> marketing. Totally marketing. Totally marketing. <laughs> You, it, you can't tell whether whiskey is good or not based on what country it's produced in. You know? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Although a month ago, I would have said I, I go towards Scotland more than anyone else. But the Orient now, it's uh, uh, there's so much whiskey out there from so many different places. Yeah. And a lot of it's just fantastic. I would also see this question, and we'll use Scotland as a reference because you, you really do have a, a regional or geographical difference in Scotland. Your islas are almost always peated. Your highland bay sites are almost or, always floral. Your lowlands are grassy. Your Campbelltons are iodine. They, they kind of have a geographical influence on their flavor, and they're all from the same country. Uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, it's just marketing. Don, uh, I think, you know, I've been a part of a group called the Malt Maniacs, which was formed in 1997. We're still going strong. We spent a lot of time in Scotland. And uh, Craig Daniels, who was one of the original guys, used to say that one of the best space side whiskeys he ever tasted was Bunnehaven. It, it has that quality. And, you know, and, and Charlie McLean is one of us. And Charlie says, you know, that's that was just made it easier to sell the whiskeys because instead of having, uh, you know, Scotland, we now have different regions and we could differentiate them. But in reality, you can find most styles in most regions. Right. It, don't, it doesn't really, it, it, it doesn't really follow through. Uh, you can find so many exceptions that it doesn't really make sense. I mean, you, even Brooklady, look at Brooklady, not really a, a, what you would call an Isla whiskey, 
when we think of Eilie, you think of of uh, Lagavulin, and then you, you think of Lafroig, and you think Ardbeg. of Ardbeg, you think of Port Allen, you know. Um, so uh, people, it's, it's an easy way to, to start getting people to notice differences in Scotch, but I think that uh, the idea of, of regions has kind of worn itself out. Right. Which it's, is, it's, it's changing now, too, with new distillers. Right, which is why I said at the end of the day, it's it's all marketing. At the like, end of the day, it's all you, marketing. You yeah. do have some general indications for an area, but but yeah, end of the day, all marketing. Yeah, space. I think when you think space, I do think sherry whiskey, you know, sherry malts, and, yeah. and you know what? I don't know if it's so bad to actually have a generalization as a teacher, especially a math teacher. You try to come up with commonalities, things to kind of focus yeah. people on when they start, right? And to a focus off on point. the different regions when they first start to get their interest up and just to give them those general statements, mm -hmm. not something to hold on to forever. We have to be able to kind of grow beyond it and realize that ah. it's not going to be the same. But mm -hmm. I really do think that for me, when I started and I was going through the regions and I could picture in my mind what to expect. And then if it was different, I liked that too, which is what I liked a lot about yeah. whiskey, the differentiation. But I always liked having something to hold on to, to kind of center my mind what to expect, even though it would be different, possibly. Yeah. yeah. I think I think what you're saying makes eminently good sense, Dolph. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, it really does. It really does. Thank you. But I think with, with everybody, if you don't have any information or you don't know anything, you're new to the whatever industry it is, you grab onto something. Oh, it's from Scotland. It's got to be good. Oh, it's bourbon. From the states, okay, I, you know, and, and they—that's where you start, and then you start to get some education, and you move move forward, and you learn a little bit. Oh, there's all kinds of different kinds of bourbon. There's all kinds of different kinds of scotch. Yeah, and the different whiskey. So yeah. it's a starting point. Yeah. Then you have Angels Envy. You throw a wrench in your plan. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, it's a place to start with. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and we should leave that behind to a, a certain point when you get beyond it. But I think going back, when I try to help someone out, I kind of focus on that. And maybe I shouldn't. But no, no. Uh, Deb, help me out with these progressions with uh, amalgamations and takeovers, please. Because I, I had these in my mind to try to set the scene. And I don't know if I'm off on the second one. So we go to Br Seagram. Bronfman joins Seagram. So they amalgamate. But then they become Perro, Ricard, and Diageo. Is that correct? Well, what happened is, um, <clears throat> yeah, Bronfman took over Seagram's. I mean, they, they yeah. legally well, they, they, they they merged. They, they had merged. a merger. But in reality, Bronfman took it over, and he took over the company, and he made it into the the largest uh, uh, whiskey company and the largest spirits company in the world, Ooh. and. Um, they went on and on, and then when you know when he died, uh, he passed it to his son, and when his son uh, died, he passed it on to, to his own son. And um, it. what happened it. is they they got into this big this big uh, uh, merger with Vivendi, and what happened is that the value of the stocks were selling, and the the Bronfman kids were all selling their getting out, you know, because it was, the thing was just imploding, and uh, when it was over. The company uh, was owned by um, well uh, by Pernod Pern Pern Ricard, but then there were there were some legal problems because they then owned too many whiskeys, and so you know, and, and so there's you know there's um, there's monopoly legislation, so they had to sell some of the whiskeys, and uh, so uh, Diageo ended up with the with the uh, with the uh, I think the bulk of them, or at least with the with the big sellers, and Bruno Ricard ended up with some of those whiskeys as well. And, and, and Diageo doesn't have too many whiskeys. Yeah, I was going to say they must be there already. But it, but, it, but Diageo was not is in the Canadian market. I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Okay, in the Canadian market, and um, it was Canadian legislation. So, uh, anyways, so 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 it kind of uh, after it imploded, it was sold sold on, and then it was split up. So that nobody had uh, too much control of the market. Okay. 
And it might kind of be the same thing with this last one, too. So I've got Wisers goes to Corby. Corby taken over by Walker. Harry Hatch into Walker. And they become allied Lions? Well, what happened is that Wisers, after after uh, Wiser died, his kids were no good at as distillers. And that the the, um, the uh, distillery just kind of went downhill. And then when Albert when um, Albert Whitney died, who had taken over the company after Wiser died, he, as a manager, when he died, it was it was just hopeless. And so the, it was it was just you know on, gone. And uh, Mortimer Davis, who owned Corby at the time, bought Wiser's. And I think he he may have tried to operate, but he soon realized that it was not a going concern. And they, and they brought the, the the labels over to Corby in Corbyville, which is near Belleville, and they started putting out Wiser's whiskey, some really good ones, I might say. Uh, they started putting out and uh, such as the Wiser's ten year old and Wiser's eighteen in the round uh, bottle. It's real good stuff. Um, then Harry Hatch worked for Corby, but he left in a fight and he bought Goodrum and Warts, and then he bought. Hiram Walker Distillery, and he merged Hiram Walker Distillery and Goodrum and Warts. And in fact, all the whiskey making was moved down to uh, to um, uh, to Windsor, or maybe piece by piece. But they kept Corby, they kept Goodrum and Warts open, making rum and and commercial and uh, industrial alcohol. And then uh, it was after Mortimer Davis died that that uh, Harry Hatch then went and bought Corby and brought kind of brought Corby into the fold. And uh, it was, uh, so it, it took a long time. And, and what you, people should, you should know too, that, that the uh, Pernod Ricard owned, oh, had also bought um, the McGinnis distillery in Toronto and they had moved McGinnis right. down to, to Corbyville to, to get, try to keep Corbyville alive, but Corbyville was failing and it ultimately did fail. So that uh, essentially the only uh, distillery that really remained was the Hiram Walker Distillery. And it's not the original Hiram Walker Distillery. It's the one that was built in the 50s and 60s. They, they rebuilt pretty much everything there. You know, but they, I mean, they kept it operating. But bit by bit, they replaced the whole thing. I think the only thing that's left that, is the building that has Hiram Walker's office in it. Yeah. Oh, and, the and that, that did it all. It, it was, uh, well, Hatch died. And it was the it was the administrators of his estate because his son was Clifford Hatch wasn't old enough to run the business, so they had administrators running it for I can't remember how long, fifteen or twenty years, and then Clifford took it over. Yeah, and people loved working for Clifford Hatch. By the way, they thought he was oh. an awesome guy. Yeah, that's yeah. nice to know. Yeah, and then Allied did a one of these takeovers, Allied Lions. And apparently they really had no interest in in Canadian club at all. They just it was just one more brand in the portfolio. They became Allied de Mac. And uh, I talked I've talked to people who worked for them. Everybody just hated it. And that's when a lot of the good people got out, you know. And uh, I mean they got packages, but uh, so a lot of them get out. And then uh, Allied de Mac became um, Became Beam, yeah, Beam, and now Beam Suntory. But the, the distillery was sold to Pernod Ricard, and it was really interesting. The decision whether the whether ownership would go to no Corby was running whether whether the, it would be a, be a, a Pernod Ricard distillery or a Beam Suntory distillery depended on who owned the most brands that were producing spirits there. Well, everybody assumed it was going to be Canadian Club because it, it it still produces more Canadian Club than any other kind of whiskey, you know. And uh, you no, know, really, that, that's by far their biggest their biggest brand. But it's owned. The Canadian Club is owned by Beam Suntory, so everybody assumed it's going to be a Beam Suntory distillery. But people forgot that they make uh, they make uh, um, uh, what's the rum the, that. Uh, Coconut flavor, Malibu rum, and okay. Malibu, Malibu rum was a Pernod product, and people were were shocked that Pernod Ricard got the distillery because well, that. Doctor Don mentioned that rum because he says he doesn't like coconut. <laughs> well, he can't smell coconut. Yeah, 
Yeah, he so, has. So that's how that happened. Oh. But I mean, and there are stories that in the deal, Beam got all the old whiskey uh, as kind of compensation for losing the distillery. But uh, you know, I haven't seen the evidence. I I have wanted to look at that, but I have not seen the evidence of that yet. But uh, but anyways, it's. Uh, it was one of those things, you know, and it's it's like it's it's kind of I mean that that was called the Canadian Club Distillery for probably a century. Mm -hmm. The Canadian Club paid for everything. They built the distillery. They paid they paid for the for uh, you know all, all the renovations. They built the paid for the whole town, everything like that, and they they lost it because because of a, a brand that uh, you the you know. <laughs> That people don't even think about coming from that distillery. Yeah. So well, I found it interesting that it was just called Club until 1888. Like, yeah. None of nothing was branded as Canadian until that point. Until they made him put it on. Well, no, it. they didn't make him put it on. He they, put it on. Yeah. <laughs> That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> Stab a naughty, naughty. You should have written that more clearly. See? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Bull Barley has a question for us. He says, I missed the CFL Shenley Awards. Who bought Shenley? Well, I Shenley became Black Velvet. Oh, oh. really? So okay. they still make Golden Wedding. Shenley, Shenley still makes Golden Wedding. Yep. Uh, That's what my dad drank. <laughs> they still make OFC and a few of those. They're made in uh, in Lethbridge, Alberta now yeah. at the Black Velvet Distillery. Really? Yeah. People Maybe, don't know yeah. that that's the second best selling whiskey in, in uh, Canadian whiskey in North America. There's actually quite a bit of stuff made in Lethbridge. It's uh, amazing. I never thought that Lethbridge did much of anything, but. <laughs> People don't know because most of it goes to the states, but yeah, there you know, Crown Royal is number one and, and Black Velvet is number two. I mean, they even beat, they even beat Canadian Club. Wow, yeah, okay. I'll well, we it. do have to go see the distillery down south. We do yeah. just it'll be a day trip when we're allowed to travel once. Uh, this will be our last question, I think. And because we're at the 42 minute mark, we're pretty close, we're doing well. Gee, and then we we'll go on to the after draft. So, uh, and this is an odd question because it's really specific. But what page did you learn the most from? And I said mine was 157, but I'm going to talk about that in a second. Is there any page that like you learn three, four, five different things on? I'll leave that to everybody. The amount of post-it notes I have in this whole section. <laughs> Is more than the rest of the book so far. <laughs> this Good. is a pretty like information heavy section. Um, so picking one page is very difficult, especially yeah. when you, you you might think it's one page and then a page or two later it expands yeah. that page even more. I agree. Um well I, every page has a minimum of one post-it note on it. Most <laughs> have two or three. <laughs> like well. I'll tell you mine. And Don actually referred to it with uh, Glenn Okopogo. Ogop so, <laughs> so for this page, it was, they talked about the effects of the depression. So Walker loses more to Angel's share than they sold over the depression, mm -hmm. which I thought was, one, it's cool, but two, they must have had so many barrels just sitting there over that period of time. Well, but uh, Gavin also alluded to the fact that when they bought the, factory for 14 million there was at least that and more in stock that was laid down yeah right so yeah, right. they had the stock to lose and it's not if they had double they lose half they're still not losing any money oh i don't feel bad for them monetarily <laughs> <laughs> i'm saying i'm picturing the amount of angel share coming out of these i don't know if we get hundreds of thousands of barrels maybe more I think I the know. angels were pretty drunk <laughs> that's all right good for them and on the same page harry hatch they talk about his massive improvements to the walker distilleries that are still in effect now which are kind of cool so again 50 60s but davin clarified that it wasn't him it was the i don't know if we want to call them directors 
director. taking over until his son takes over? Yeah, I can't remember if it was. I, I assume it was the directors, but I guess right. somebody was administering the estate in any case. And I'm going to ask you this because they made their uh, distillery in the Okanagan called the Okanagan, or in Kelowna called the Okanagan Distillery. Uh huh. And was that Hatch or was that the kids? Or not the that kids? Was, that was the kids. Okay. And yeah. not just that, but the Okanagan Distillery made, for one, I didn't know there was a distillery there in the 70s and 80s. And I didn't know that they made it for Centauri, which is really kind of cool right now. Yeah. Maybe in the 80s I wouldn't have cared. I don't know. But I think it's kind of cool. Canadian and, uh, whiskey for the Japanese that all the Canadians want back. Yeah. You know, uh, the Suntory business was a side business. It really was built as a, as another, a second Canadian club distillery. Uh, they made Canadian club there. And, yeah. uh, and, it, and, it was, and they supplied Canadian club to the Western states and the distillery in, in Windsor su supplied Canadian club to the Eastern states. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, the market was so huge that Windsor just couldn't keep up with it. But uh, of course, the bottom fell out of that, and once Suntory pulled out, that was the end of the distillery. And, yeah. uh, uh, interesting. Didn't you that say that they still make something there, Devin? It's gone. It's demolished. It's total. It's torn right down. But I, I did get there when it was a fuel alcohol plant. Yep. It, okay. And uh, yeah, so they were making fuel alcohol there afterwards. But then uh, I don't know wh what happened after that. But I know that it was demolished, and those beautiful big. You know, column cells were just pulled over and really? probably, probably melted down. Ah, that's a waste. And no. the last one, uh, oh. their all their malt was sold for blends, but never sold in a bottle. And I think you said somebody said, or one of their blenders had dubbed it Glen Ogopogo. That's right. And does anyone want to explain what Ogopogo is for 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 others? <laughs> I talk a lot, so I'll leave that to you. No? O Ogopogo is uh, um, suspected to be uh, a, a serpentite fish, but it's more legend, and it, it just gives the area a lot of draw for tourists because they all come looking for this illusorious fish that nobody has really ever had great pictures or been able to prove in that it's alive. So, Isn't it related to uh, the Loch Ness Monster? Yes, it is. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's our version of Sasquatch. Yeah, yeah. Got a story around there. yeah. you got to have a monster. Yeah. I get a great one. Laura, <laughs> so. Uh, so we've hit the 47 minute mark of this and you know what Devin I finally got it under an hour for the very first time since our very first time that we came on so I, I think we did fairly well with this I was going to say one more question to somebody in the chat we could go for another 13 minutes <laughs> nope we're, that's okay we can do the after dram and I'm looking forward to the after drama. I look forward to all of us. So this has been a fantastic start to our evenings. Less of a start for Davin, of course, who's two hours ahead of us in Ottawa. And uh, <laughs> thanks again to the panel. Thanks to Davin for joining us tonight. We're going to be back sa Saturday, May 1st, 7 o'clock, Mountain Standard Time, where we discuss Section 5 of this book. This book. No, oh, got this it. Book. That book. But not this right. book yet. A bit sad, oh. actually. Dude. Because it's our second last time with Davin. But it's not too sad as we'll be talking to him again for a while in the after dram. So join us in about five minutes on this channel for your Walking Dead style debrief, a more relaxed time together. And in the words of Dr. Dawn, cheers, eh? Cheers, eh? <laughs> he always does. It's so a cheers, eh? I'll see you guys in a bit, and hopefully we see our viewers on the other side. Give us five Inside. minutes. We'll be right there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And.